I'm back. Pay no attention to the hiatus between the videos. Today I've returned to ramble about Fall Out Boy's sophomore album from Under the Cork Tree, released in 2005, when I was too busy being enrolled in kindergarten to truly appreciate it. I feel like I've wasted all of my time. Whenever I speak about an album as a whole, that is because I consider it to be incomplete without every entry, sort of a no-skip sort of situation. That being said, I definitely have more to say about certain songs in this album than other ones. You'll see. <laughs> I'm allowed to be biased because this is my channel and I get to choose the hyperfixation. I don't have much to say as a preamble this time, so let's just get into it. Number one, Our Lawyer. This album, like, all of the pre-hiatus albums begins with ambient noise. This time, it's chatter of the paparazzi and the clicking of flashing of cameras, a song our tabloid darling Pete Wentz was sure to be well acquainted with. The original title is said to be some movie reference that I'm too young to understand, but the current version is often nicknamed Fashion Sense, which is ironic if you've ever actually seen paparazzi photos of Pete Wentz. The guitars here are heavy like an overloaded washing machine, it's a heaviness needed to open the album. The lyrics seem to be mocking the viewpoint of the very paparazzi that flashed the cameras in the opening of the song, saying they're only worth as much as the latest trends in their almost famous friends. It's like a middle finger. It's a blown raspberry in the face of the tabloids. And it wouldn't be Fall Out Boy with just the longest song title to exist on earth. Number two of all the gin joints. This entry is a lot shorter. I'll make up for later, I promise. There's a line in this one. I used to waste my time dreaming of being alive. Now I only wasted dreaming of you. It is heavily set up in the second song as a reoccurring motif, but it returns again in the second to last song as kind of an almost bookend. I don't have much to say about this one, but if you're listening to the whole album, it is a no skip album. Don't skip the song. Number three, dance dance. This song gets me hype like nothing else. It makes me feel like I'm on cocaine. The bass line could wake me up from a coma. I nearly passed out from pure excitement when they came on in concert. Seriously, I was dizzy, I couldn't breathe, I had to sit down and catch my breath while still experiencing all of it. I had been waiting for that moment for years. I want to tattoo the song into my skin and let the lyrics and the melody flow through my bloodstream. It is the perfect three minutes. Each part of this four part band, the drum line, the bass, the guitar, and the vocals operate at their peak for the entire duration of the track. I feel blessed to exist at the same time as this song. Sometimes I wish to induce amnesia for just three minutes so that I could re-experience this for the first time all over again. I cannot overstate how much I love this song. I don't even know how to explain why. I mean, it does have one of my favorite couplets, which is, why don't you show me a little bit of spine you've been saving for his mattress? I only want sympathy in the form of you crawling into bed with me. And the bass line is so recognizable and beloved that MGK sampled it as a cheat code when he was trying to hack his way into the pop punk scene, which it kind of worked. Other than that, I can only say that something about it clicks for me. It's the puzzle piece that my brain was missing. It's a fundamental part of your research when you're trying to understand me as a person. You guys know I'm a sucker for good lyrics. And the ones that stand out to me here are, I'm two quarters and a heart down. These words are all I have, so I'll write them. You need them just to get by. We're falling apart to half time, and this is the way they love if they knew how misery loved me. In my mind, the bass's melody goes down at the end and not up, but I can only really blame that on the Mandela effect. And uh, the video that goes along with this song shows the best Fall Out Boy photo shoot that I've ever seen. It's my favorite one. They're such like dorks, but they're also the heroes of the video. And when Patrick sings, uh, why don't you show me a little bit of spine you've been saving for this mattress, love, he does the heart. And uh, he does it in every single concert appearance which I can only assume is because it's as contagious to him as it was to me the first time I watched the video. Number four, Sugar We're Going Down. There is something to be said about the ease that technology has brought to music production. Anyone with an idea can make a song. Take, for example, Steve Lacey's Dark Red. The song went viral in 2020 and was notably produced entirely in GarageBand with presets. Now, no offense to Steve Lacey, but there's a huge difference between preset drum loops and playing drums to be recorded in the studio. 
It's in the physics of it all. When you're playing the drums, the drumstick hits the skin of the drum, making a compact vibration at the point of impact. That vibration then carries through the hollow inside of the drum, compacts again through the exterior, and only then does it go through the air to hit your ears. With the preset loop, the sound gets unified and flattened and cut off. But when you play the drums in studio, you get the full hollow sounds of the drum. You get an echo of the beat as it bounces off of the walls. You get the residual sounds of the rest of the drum set shaking from how much force you put into it. There is so much to be said about the accessibility of music technology. But then again, the novelty of playing an instrument will never be overstated. I say all this to carry us into the beginning beats of Sugar, another riff I could recognize in a coma. When the drums and the opening chords of the guitar collide, it's full-bodied and whole. This song, while not my favorite off the album, I could talk about for months. I do believe that it's just one of the peaks of Pete Wentz's lyricism, despite the baffling fact that Patrick Stump has admitted to slurring the words on purpose to make them sound better. The words are so painstakingly chosen and placed, but with the purposefully switched, drop a heart, break a name, the misleading dismissal of, I'm just a notch in your bedpost, but you're just a line in a song, and the main chorus of, I'll be your number one with a bullet, a loaded gun complex, cock it and pull it. During the last chorus, an echo of take aim at myself, take back what you say can be heard and it perfectly frames that centerpiece. The leading line, am I more than you bargained for, is emphasized with a piano, which is the only place this instrument is found in the entire song, making sure that you will never forget this line. Lastly, this is another song whose subject matter is conspicuously queer. Sleeping in and sleeping for the wrong team and watching you two from the closet aren't mistakes. They're not accident. The video shows a boy with antlers out of place in a town that alienates and at points hunts him down, which also could be a reference to Pete's biracial upbringing, which left him feeling out of place and needing to join a scene of people who were also out of place. The song captures a romance that can't be, or maybe even isn't. The words want to be defeated, but the melody just won't allow it. It's hopeful despite itself. I understand why this was put on the top 100 best songs of all time. It's an anthem sung in the key of optimism. It's a bright and sunny day. It's something to put on the shelf alongside your most prized possessions. Number five, Nobody Puts Baby in the Corner. This chronicles a pair, or perhaps even a group, of misfits and outcasts that engage in cheap thrills to keep them warm and spend their time. They're content being each other's best kept secret and biggest mistake. This song contains one of my favorite sets of lyrics of all time. Wear me like a locket around your throat, I'll weigh you down, I'll watch you choke. You look so good in blue. If I was old enough for AIM when it was around, this would have been my away message for sure. But since I can't have that, I made it my description on Discord. And if you're wondering, falling apart to halftime is my idol message there. <laughs> Number six, I've got a dark alley. The torrid history behind this song makes it the saddest on the record. This record describes the rambling thoughts of an again suicidal Pete before his attempt in 2005. Allegedly, the line, I want to be known for my hits, not just my misses, has been written as misses paying a bitter homage to his then wife ashley simpson number seven seven minutes in heaven out of van halen this is a chronicle of someone desperate for companionship someone who knows they don't do too well on their own willing to spend the night with anyone who keep them company their star to be fixated on when the world comes crashing down the guest vocals are performed by brendan neary who sounds so unlike himself in this feature that i couldn't even recognize him until i looked up the credits Despite this fact, him and Stum's vocals blend beautifully in the tiered harmony right before the Van Halen style guitar solo. Number eight, Sophomore Slump. They start off by predicting exactly what they do to me. They're the therapist pumping through my speakers. They're the chemist who found the formula to make my heart swell and burst. They ask the question we all fear at some point. Are we growing up or just going down? The swear to burn the city down to show you the light continues the motif of violence as romance, which you'll soon come to realize I adore if you haven't already. The swear is emphasized by complete cutoff of instruments on that one syllable to let you know he really means it. Another I hate this city lies in the words, I need to take a pill to make this town feel okay. Unfortunately, this song also contains the most trite failure of a lyric. The best part of Believe is the lie. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? Or in this case, the annoyingly Instagrammable Hot Topic-esque lyric or the t-shirts those words got printed on? I'm only harsh because I know they can do better. Number nine, 
Champagne for my real friends, real pain for my sham friends. This song reminds me of this long road trip my family took the, to the beach one year when I spent the entire car ride there and back, dunking my head in pre-hiatus Fall Out Boy for the first time, irreversibly changing the trajectory of my life. If I had a nickel for every time Fall Out Boy mentioned a little black dress in a song, I'd have two nickels, which isn't a lot, but it's notable. Here, the band professes that they're only in it for the experience, that the money doesn't matter, that they wish they could bring everyone on their journey with them. Predictably, with any pop punk album, they do the whole I hate my hometown shtick, but with the more poetic twist, the sounds of this small town make my ears hurt. It's a line I look forward to every time this song comes up. Not to mention, I'm a big fan of stars and flames imagery. I know I get some of my poetic habits from here. Number 10. I slept with someone in Fall Out Boy and all I got was this stupid song written about me. I know I say this about like every song, but this one used to be my favorite. It's red and it's burning. It's the most punk song I knew before I actually listened to punk music. Personally, I interpret the I found the cure to growing older in a romantic you make me feel young forever sort of way instead of the more morbid I'm going to kill myself type of way that some other people interpret it. Mostly because at this point I'm... Pretty in tune with Pete Wentz's morbid style of romance. <laughs> From the first two power chords that open the song, you know you're in for a ride. I really wouldn't be able to tell you what he's singing about here. It's almost like he's bitter about a past lover and he's telling them off, calling them as cheap as the perfume they douse themselves in, crying you can't cover it up, while also holding them as one of the only ones who gets it, another kid who's vicious and carved out of stone. And despite everything, he's missing them to death. During the bridge, Patrick and Pete alternate vows. Someone old, no one new, feeling borrowed, always blue. You know how he is with his old adages and his funky turns of phrase. Their voices blend together in a way that almost blurs the line between who's Patrick and who's Pete. And this phenomenon reminds me of their stage presence, where Pete will often whisper the lyrics as written into the crook of Patrick's neck, and then Patrick will in turn belt them into the microphone. Pete, quote, considers himself a singer that speaks through Patrick like some post-punk oracle of Delphi. And in the few times that people offer pain screams or tortured poetry at the latter half of the songs, you can see that vision come to life. Number 11, 16 Candles. 16 Candles comes from the perspective of what I can only imagine is the pathetic self-flagellating incel junior in high school. He's all, woe is me, fine, I messed up, I'm a loser, I'm a creep, I'm a weirdo, yada yada. <laughs> Despite this, it's a bop. The chorus of the song gives a peppy yet sardonic look at high school relationship. The it girl, the nobody, and his endless plight to catch her attention and good graces. The melody itself is so catchy and anthemic that it was used in promotional material of an off-kilter dating sim called Class of 09, where the characters are just as snippy and or pathetic as the characters in this song. It's just as in place here as it would be the opener of some badly rated teen movie from like 2006. Number 12. Get busy living or get busy dying. This song is a bit of an odd one. It's something I almost want to skip despite my no skip rule. It's something that feels disjointed and more than a little awkward. But the galloping drum beat, the deflective lyrics, the reprise of I used to obsess over living, now I only obsess over you, sung again in the back and forth style of both Pete and Patrick, and the end poem, it keeps me coming back despite myself. The air in the song is cold. It's about being self-conscious about the art you create, about not knowing if you've got anything to say that's novel or original, about feeling embarrassed about the scrutiny you've been put under saying, oh, I didn't mean anything by that. And I can't help but think that your secret's out and the best part is it isn't even a good one is a hilarious line. As I stated before, this song contains my favorite Pete Wentz end poem. It's melodramatic in its hopeless despair. It's morbid, it's desperate, and it asks the question, why put a new address on the same old loneliness? Number 13, XO. In the beginning of the song, again, the audio is split between hushed whispers and the beating heart of a bass on either side of you, and the music escalates as the night does. Lyrics taking us through movements of the one night stand, leading us to the love that so constantly evades him. When Stump sings, what did it ever do for me? It's unclear to me whether the it here refers to the Bible or its conscience, regardless, Neither one calls out to him in his time of need. And instead of waiting for either one to call to him, he takes the love he's been denied by force, choosing it over sympathy. The harmonies carry the song like a lullaby. I adore the imagery of through the keyhole I watched you dress, kiss and tell, loose lips sink ships. He wants to tell secrets that he knows will destroy him. There's something to be said about knowing which track is a closer. There needs to be a sense of finality, of closure. And if I were to have everything I wanted, recurring motifs from the rest of the album, 
whether melodic or lyrical. It needs to inspire a quiet reminiscence at the art you just observed. It should be the last bite of a meal that holds all the flavors and leaves you full and in a quiet state of digestion. Nathan Zed has talked about what he refers to as the lost art of album sequencing, but I don't think it's lost. I think it's hiding. While not every song is obviously painstakingly ordered, ushered into the exact right seat for optimal viewing, choices like that are still made. For example, take the beginning and end here. Take the impassioned yelling of the poem in Get Busy Living into the hushed whispers of XO. Take the final chord of the song, left sustained and drowning out for 10 seconds, allowing the record to be draped in silence, like the curtains closing and the lights dimming at the end of a play. Take the misplaced bookends of the lyrical motif. Take the purposefully excluded B-sides that just wouldn't fit anywhere in the original lineup, but are still too good to keep off the album altogether. It's a little treat for another time. And with that, our beloved cork tree draws to a close, putting a bedtime on our teen angst story at the end of this 45 minutes. This album was my soundtrack of choice when I was getting ready for my senior prom because I think that it thrives in that specific context, and it tells a story so whole and yet incomplete that I was compelled to write a musical using this album as a soundtrack while I was, admittedly, avoiding some sort of schoolwork. This seems to be the context in which most of my ideas thrive. Regardless, it's an album that I keep coming back to, because I mean what I say when I think that this album is home to some of the best songs that I've ever heard. While I do think that Fall Out Boy is great, and I don't subscribe to any of that sellout garbage, it's worth noting how absolutely potent their pre-hiatus discography is. They came in through the gate swinging, and it was absolutely relentless until it fall out. Hits like Grand Theft Autumn, Dead on Arrival, Dance Dance, Sugar We're Going Down, Thanks for the Memories, This Ain't a Scene, and so many more truly do hold weight against post-hiatus hits like Centuries, Light em Up, Uma Thurman, and more. If post-hiatus and pre-hiatus were in the ring, pre-H is taking the belt. All that being said, thank you for tuning in. Um, let me know your thoughts and comments uh, below. Uh, this filming has been the most tumultuous I've had so far. Hopefully it only gets easier from here. I hope you enjoyed this. Subscribe if you want more. And I'm your host, Kane Sugar, and I'll see you in the fallout.